Good day everyone and welcome to the ViBSD channel. I'm your loving and slightly beer enhanced host and this time we'll be doing something a little different. In this series I'll be doing my best to non-scriptedly meander through FreeBSD's network components and common network network issues, questions, comments, you know, pretty much anything. Um, this is kind of freeze hand, I uh, not scripted this whatsoever, so I am just um, hoping that the content store remains good for you guys. Um, now, for the Windows desktop, I know we're kind of used to setting off with the, um, you know, the putty screen with Z shell and the remote servers and stuff, but this time, um, because we might be tackling some more technical networking issues, such as, you know, fibs, multi-gateway routing, and bits and pieces like that. Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start off by showing how I create a virtual network and all of the different components of it in Windows so I can send to YouTube and, you know, actually do the videos and things. I mean, obviously, for the Bive series, I, I just use a dedicated FreeBSD server because it has to, you, you know, you can't stick a VM in a VM. Well, you can with some horrible hacks and usual massive instability, but <laughs> that's for something else. Okay, so let's begin. Um, so first things, we're going to need VirtualBox. Um, I have chose VirtualBox instead of Bive, VMware, Hyper-V, and all the rest of it, simply because I thought, you know what, this is probably what most people are going to have the easiest access to. Um, and I'm going to kick off by showing how to actually be a little bit more efficient with disk space in FreeBSD. So I am going to create a new machine and I'm going to call it FreeBSD 12.1 um, release base. And I don't need that bit. I'll pop it just there. By the way, for those of you that are observant, when I said this wasn't rehearsed whatsoever, I did actually try shooting this earlier today and got in a bit of a clutch. So I thought, you know what, it's actually easier just to reshoot it. Anyone who ever uses Vegas Pro to edit, if you are using OBS to record, make sure that you set your outputs to MP4 and not MKV because they're just not compatible. <laughs> but anyway, on with the show. So we are creating a basic FreeBSD machine, and we're going to use one gig of RAM, 1,024 megabytes. Um, and I'm going to create a virtual hard drive. Uh, VDI, sure. Uh, dynamically allocated. Um, location to save. Okay, so we are saving to F drive. That's fine. Okay, so I'm assuming, oh right, okay, so that creates the project base, okay. Right, so I'm just going to call that image because it's already encapsulated in there. If I'd have actually looked ahead, I'd have created the entire system underneath that header, but so so. Um, 20 gig should be more than enough for anything we need. So we'll create that, and there we go. The joys of SSDs in RAID 0. Um, now, first thing, I am going to go into settings, and I'm going to processor, and I'm going to say use four processors. Um, the current system I'm on is an i5-6600K, so it's a um, virtual eight-core, well, virtual eight-thread, four-core jobby. It's four cores, you know, and hyper-thread, so it comes up as eight, and yeah, all the rest of that. Um, and I am going to remove floppy from the boot order. And I'm going to raise optical and I'm going to raise hard drive. In fact, I'm going to raise hard drive to the top and put optical there. Um, let's see here. Pointing device. I'm going to put a USB tablet because I don't want my mouse pointer swallowing. Uh, that looks pretty good. Yep. Um, display. 16 megabytes should be fine. Don't think enabling 3D acceleration would work or even be worthwhile. Um, no need for remote display, no need for recording, storage, okay. Um, so that's the image we created. Um, IDE. Well, I know in Bive that using IDE is pretty horrible. I know what, let's use, let's use something different. Let's use, um, let's use SATA, AHCI SATA. Okay. So yes, I want to use my image. And I also want to add an optical drive. And okay. 
So I keep a copy of my FreeBSD, Linux, Windows, images, and all the rest of it on NAS. Oh, and it's actually came up automatically. Handy. So yeah, you if you don't do this, this is really, really handy to do. What's another? Ooh, Solaris. Ooh, don't want that. No, go to BSD. Um, so yes, um, we're going to use the FreeBSD 12.1 release AMD 64 DVD-1 ISO. You could use the CD-1 rather than the DVD-1 or uh, pretty much anything but network. I'll come around to why in a minute. So there we go. We've got our storage set up. Audio, there's no point, so let's disable that. Network, um, disable everything, which is... Is this the right thing to do? Let me think. We're going to create the base image. No, we want to completely disable networking. Yes, right. So we're not actually going to connect any network adapters to this whatsoever. And no serial ports and USB. I think we have to have this enabled to actually get the USB tablet thing to work. So I'm going to leave that. Shared folders, pretty much pointless unless we want to install Samba. Um, Samba, is that right? Yes, yeah, Samba. Not Squid. No, Samba. Yes, that's right. Which is the Windows network client thing, which is what you need to do to use the shared folders. Um, use, I don't even know, what, I don't even know what's in user interface, so yeah, fine. <laughs> right, so now we're going to kick this off. We're going to start the installation. And I'm not going to do a manual installation, and I'm not going to actually install ZFS on this either. The reason, simply being, is that, is there any way I can scale this? I don't... I've done a few ZFS videos already, and bearing in mind the um, specs on this box, only being a gigabyte and everything else, it's just going to be unnecessary yet, overhead. The main reason um, for this, or at least the main focus of this series, is for networking, and we don't need fast I.O. for networking. So, why don't I do that? Quick slurp of beer. By the way, if, if you happy, if you happen to be in the realm of Asda, this is a really fantastic ale you should try. It's a four for six pounds at the moment, which is lovely. So we're going to go on with the installation, and I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom and go for United Kingdom. Obviously, choose United States if you're from there, or Belgian, or Bulgarian, or whatever. Anyway, just the normal thing. Now. This is going to become the master image, which we are actually going to create linked clones of, which kind of works like ZFS snapshot in, uh, well, ZFS snapshots to clones, where all the machines that are formed off it are basically diffs off it, which use less space. So I'm just going to call this base.ytnet. Sure, why not? Um, not interested in that. Not interested in that either. Um, auto UFS, entire disk, and we're going to use GPT. And yeah, actually, that's not too bad. That's actually what I've put, what I would have done manually anyway. So we've got one gigabyte for swap, 19 gigabytes for UFS, and a tiny little bit for the boot, which perfectly fine. And then we get to see how fast these SSDs actually are. Oh, then again, it won't be the SSDs that slow this down. It'll be because I'm reading the ISO off the um, NAS drive, I'd have thought. Hmm. Over NetBIOS in Windows, over to VirtualBox. Yes, not too many abstraction layers there whatsoever. Hmm. <laughs> so what do I get to talk about while it's doing this very slowly? Um, yes, um... So I am basically going to be setting up the base image in this episode and all oh, that's going to be fine and dandy. Uh, probably be setting up some UTF-8 stuff as well. Um, if you have any particular network problems or questions that you want answering, if you pop them in the comments and I'm actually going to try and build the series up based on what people request. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I'm going to try my best. Um, one of the questions I am going to try and answer, by the way, because I know that there is a lot of questions online about this and there are very few answers, and the answers that are there are horrible, um, is about if you have multiple internet gateways, like you have, you've bought two DSL lines or you know, you've know got two 4G phones or whatever like that, um, we will be dealing with that. Um, so I'm just going to slap a password in here. Um, configure IPv for what interface? I haven't given you any. Let's let me know there. 
And Europe. Well, not anymore, but <laughs> well, um, United Kingdom. Yes. Skip, skip. Hey there, from the edit. Let me hop in on myself right here and just mention that I made a bit of a boo-boo. If you are following this and copying the steps, do not enable Secure Shell D. You'll see why later in the video. Err, uh, mouse D, PST mouse pointer on console. Am I going to need that for a USB mouse? Not sure. I'm going to leave that one as it is. Um, secure Shell D. Probably going to require it on every machine anyway, so I'm going to leave that one on. Um, dump Dev, we're using UFS, so we can, so I will. NTP date and NTD. I would say if you're going to do this and you're going to do it, especially in any type of production environment, then enable those. I don't really need it. Um, I am going to enable, enable local unbound just because it might come in handy later. But yeah, that seems relatively fine. Um, security options. I'm just going to disable send mail um, and clear temp. Yeah, I mean, all of these are enab enableable later. Uh, I, I think almost everyone disables send mail nowadays. Clear temps. It's just a nice thing to do, really. Um, if you see any others you like, obviously stick them on. But yeah, yeah, they can be easily enabled in sysctl later. So, yes, okay. Would you like to like any users to the system? Yes, I will add myself. And I'm going to add myself to wheel. Just, I'm pretty sure most of the people watching here know, but um, if you would invite yourself to wheel, it allows you to use the su command to become root. Um, and I'm going to need another password. Okay. And nope, just me'll do. Okay, cool. <sighs> Looks good. Um, the installation is now finished. For extending the installer, would you like to open a shell in the new system? Nope. And because I've set the hard drive to boot before the CD-ROM, it should actually take us straight into the system when this reboots. Let's find out. <laughs> Probably won't. Ah, uh, doing YouTube unscripted is kind of hard. <laughs> if anything goes terribly wrong, I, yeah, I'm trying my best. <laughs> Okay, looking good. That didn't boot off the CD. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Notice for um, you hub one. Let's log in. Um, let's check how many CPUs we've got. Grab. Um, is it N CPU? Ah, there we go. Yes, N CPU four. Perfect. Okay, so it's passed through that we've got four CPUs. Um, what else do I need to check? Um, oh, I need to actually set up the base system here. But I may have made a little bit of a problem because I let Secure Shell run, didn't I? That was naughty. Hmm. See, the issue is with this being a linked base, the fact that Secure Shell has actually generated its um, base certificates and everything else is quite a problem because every single clone will also have those. So what I am going to do is quickly reinstall it and not enable a secure shell. And I'm actually just going to kill this in post edit and chop it out. So in a minute, you'll see me booting a different FreePSD system with the same everything, just with secure shell disabled. And we should be back. So hopefully this one's gonna fire up without Secure shell initializing and generating its keys. Let's see. <laughs> Looking good so far. Booting kind of slow though. Yes, all looks happy. Unbound is generated. Resolve.conf is not there because we're not connected to a network. Cool. So what we have here is a completely blank base system. There is no secure shell. There is no, well, really anything. There's just my key map set. Um, unbounds there. Dump dev set to auto. Um, I'm going to clean this file up a little. Um, yeah. 
and just make it a little easier to read. These get a little bit large sometimes. So, what I like to do is just separate everything out nicely like that. And dump dev come up here. There we go. That looks prettier. Lovely. Um, the next thing we're going to do is go into uh, login.com, I believe. Yes. And we're going to enable UTF-8 because, well, nowadays, why wouldn't you? Um, class set is equal to UTF-8. And I have just forgotten... <laughs> what this bit is. Uh, is it locale? Um, I'm just going to have to have a quick peek. Let me have a look. FreeBSD locale login.com NGB solved. As I said, guys, sorry, I am really free winging this. <laughs> um, dun 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 dun. Ah, ha ha. Right, sorry, it's lag. I knew it was something. I knew local, locale wasn't right. So I'm going to be ngb.utf-8. Um, yep, parser is utf-8. That all looks right. Yep, cool. Okay. So, cap mkdb. There we go. And now we've got UTF-8. Well, we haven't got UTF-8 yet. If I type locale, it'll all be C. But if I was to log in again, yay, UTF-8. Um, all this basically means is that if you're going to use Zshell and oh my Zshell and all the rest of it, and you're going to install a UTF-8 supported font, you can get you know uh, pretty things and you know, nice, nice, uh, nicely um, decorated terminals, which seems all the rage nowadays. Um, okay, what do we need? What do we next need to set in our base image? Um, okay, actually, what do we need to set next in the base image? I'm pretty sure send mail is already disabled. Yes, it is. Oh, we're going to want PF. I forgot about that. Uh, base kernel loadables, and we're going to want pf enable is equal to yes. <coughs> Little note on this: I know some people prefer IPFW. I am going to make a video on it. I promise. But since since FreeBSD for I don't even know how long ago it was. I always had a bit of trouble reading the IPFW documentation and actually getting things working with it. So I learned PF instead, and it's always worked for me. So I'm going to leave it at that. I am really, really trying to actually get in touch with someone to, you know, give me a little hand and actually put some IPFW stuff out there. I mean, I have used it for the layer 2 Mac filtering stuff. I suppose that would be kind of handy. Um, but I would have to kernel compile for that, and I will show you why later. Um, so yes, anyway, we have next reboot, we will have pf and pf log enabled. I mean, we could actually load them now just with kld load pf and pf log, and then we'll have, there we go, pf's loaded and pf log's loaded, and we could even enable the firewall because the default is, well, basically allow all. Actually, this may error. This might error because the config file might not be there. Okay, apparently not. The default PF config file, by the way, is etcpf.conf, which is a new file. Okay, um, I'm going to say I did just save that as a blank file, so we have actually got that there now. Um, I'm also going to um, basically give us more routing tables, as that's probably going to come into play later. So it may as well be in the base image. 
Um, I'm pretty sure it's net.fibs, but I'm just going to check with CCTLA grep fibs. Yep, net.fibs. And this is a boot time setable, so I'm going to have to put it in bootload.com. Net.fibs is equal to 10. Um, this is excessive. Even with a dual gateway host, you don't really need 10 routing tables. Um, but the actual overhead for it is pretty low, so I'm more inclined to actually just put it at 10 just for future proofing, basically. Ah, oh, God. I love that banana bread beer. Um, okay, so a quick summary. What have we done? We have a fully non networked system, we have a firewall enabled, we have multiple routing tables, we have UTF 8. Is there anything else that I want to add to this base image? Ah, yes. Okay, yes, yes, got it. Um, so sometimes on a FreeBSD system, when you're on top, you'll see that there's all these, um, well, uh, what user does that run under? Oh, it runs on the root, of course it does. Um, you will see that there is a lot of processes running around for Getty, and the reason for that is basically they're your virtual terminals. These these VTTY V1s, two threes, which you can use with Alt F1, Alt F2, Alt F3, and all the rest of it. Um, I kind of don't see the point of having those lurking around because really, realistically, you only use your real. And primary TTY anyway, especially when you use Tmux and other software, like, you know, other software, I mean, Screen, I suppose, as well, but, I mean, who'd use Screen when you could use Tmux? <laughs> so, anyway, um, yes, if you go to into ETC TTYS, and you go down here, and you find here, TTY V128, and you set the motor off, not odd, Like so, um, you can basically remove those from both top and actually existing in the first place. Um, <clears throat> well, and I think that's about all we want in our base image. We don't want to install any packages or anything like that because, well, we're going to use ports and, well, even if we don't use ports. Packages updated all the time, so there's no real point actually adding them to this base image. This is really all the core stuff. Um, so we've got the firewall, send mails disabled. We've got with my little Getty removal because it's useless thing. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. So what we're going to do is reboot the system to make sure everything's still alive, which it should be. and wait ominously. Here we go. <sighs> Do -ba -do. And this should be a nice fast boot, I'd have hoped. Ah, yes, I need to explain that. Okay, these warnings. Because we now have 10 routing tables, well, effectively 10, 0 to 9, um, you've always got one routing table, which is called FIB0. This is your default, and that's probably what most people are kind of used to using. When FreeBSD initializes, it always makes a route for localhost, 127.0.0.1, and it basically gets a little confused when there's 10 routing tables. I might be wrong here. It's something that I've never particularly looked into, and obviously, at the IPv6 version, the call and call on one is the same. Um, all routing tables are based off FIB0, at least as far as I understand. So, when it tries to re add them like this, it hits that error. That probably wasn't as detailed as everyone wanted. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to show you a more practical example. If I log in here, and I do setfib0 netstar, which will show the routing table. 
that is the base routing table. And as you can see, LO0 is already in it. Now, if we look at setfib1, which is, you know, obviously the next routing table up, it will be exactly the same. All of the routing tables above zero seem to be based on zero. I don't know if zero is based on something else and they're actually all abstracted off that. But anyhow, that is how that looks. Now, that is the base system. We have a completely working FreeBSD system we can log into and all the basics are laid out. So what I'm actually going to do now is shut it down because we're happy with it. I should have actually made sure that PF and everything was loaded there, but it, trust me, it is. <laughs> so now, how do you create um, minor clones of this? So what you want to do is you want to right click on it and go to clone. And there we go, it'll do all that bit again. And we're not interested in that path. And we want to call it FreeBSD release. And we're going to call this one gateway. Because this will be the one that, you know, actually emulates having three network interfaces, two external, one internal, to a private LAN nothing else can see. Um, I am going to tell it to regenerate all new MAC addresses, despite the fact that this will be created with no network adapters because it's a clone of the first one which had no network adapters. So yes, next, and we want a linked clone because we want to save some space and we're going to clone. And there we have it. 12.1 release gateway, lovely. Now in the settings for this one, or should I create the clients as well? No, we'll do it step by step. Okay, so this is the gateway. I am going to basically tell this that on adapter one, I want it attached to NAT, and in advanced, I want it to be virtual, uh, virtualized, virtio.net. Um, and what this will do is this will create a fake virtual network on the host and basically attach this to it, which is what we want because we want to, we want to simulate having two network gateways. For the most part, it's not gonna to matter too much for the different network things if we wanna show what it's like with one network adapter or one external interface. It's just the fact that we need to configure it here. So there we go. We have one network adapter using para virtualized because FreeBSD 12 supports it. In fact, anything beyond 10 does, I believe. Certainly anything above 11 or including 11 does. Um, and we are going to create a second one as well using the same para virtualized. There we go. Um, a little note to anyone who's wondering, VirtualBox will create two entirely separate virtual nets for these. It won't stick them on the same LAN and you know sling both of them the same gateway IP or anything like that, which is perfect for our purposes now. And on the third network adapter, we are going to go internal network and we are gonna call it um, YouTube net. Yeah, well, hold on, let's be more specific, YouTube net. There we go. Um, so any other devices that we want to add behind this are going to use that internal network. And once again, we are going to give a para virtualized Viteo net, and all is happy. Now, bearing in mind that I'm planning to run this series for a while, um, I'm also going to adjust and actually add the adapter for and I am basically going to say not attached and it's para virtualized and do that. And the reason for this is um, I want that adapter to show up even though we're not using it in case we have to later. So yeah, that's basically the, um, the, the gist of this. So we've got adapter one that is NAT um, para virtualized. Adapter two is the exact same. Adapter three is on an internal network called YouTube net. And adapter four is not attached. Um, a little note on this, on the um, adapter three, which is the internal network. The virtual networks it creates are actually quite isolated. So you can create as many of these internal networks if you like, if you've got some really fancy routing to do with different VPNs and such that are on the same IP ranges or anything weird like that. Um, and I'm gonna whack okay here. And I am going to fire it up. and wait a little while while it fires up. Oop. 
and we should see four network devices pop up as VTNet. There's zero, one, two, three, all there. Lovely. And obviously we'll type our login incorrectly because that's always the best way to proceed. So now if I type if config, I've got all my VTNet devices there. As expected, 10 gigabit base T, which would be really nice. I mean, I suppose it is because it's virtualized, so it can be as fast as it likes. It's fast as the host bridge. <gasps> Deep breath after that one. But yeah, anyway, so we now have a virtual gateway that has four different network adapters. Two of them are <coughs> connected to a fake NAT, and I can prove that by doing a quick DH client VTNAT0. And there's a DHCP offer, and I can you know, ping Google or whatever. Um, a little interesting point here, um, because this video is actually now coming to an end, because I've showed the base system being created. But if I was to do a setfib1 DH, DH client VTNet1, um, you can see that I've got a different IP range, 10.0.3 um, 10 rather than 10.0.2. Um, I could now actually use the different gateways by just using the setfib command and that one would be using the first network adapter vtnet0 and this one setfib1 would be using the other NAT gateway and basically that's how fibs kind of work. Um, obviously if I was to choose one of the, um, the um, routing tables or fibs that didn't have anything assigned to it no route host, nothing is set. And you can actually um, really see that when you do a netstat R on the interfaces. Um, this is routing table one. There you can see the 2.2 um, gateway. And if I did the same on routing table one, I'm gonna have 3.2. And if I did it on setfib two, I've got no gateway whatsoever. Um, but you can actually see that the on setfib two, even though I've got no default route or gateway, I've still got um, the internet destination 10.020 slash 24 is on VTNet 0 and 3.0 slash 24 is on VTNet 1. And the reason for that is that those adapters are physically connected to the machine, so they will show up in every single routing table we have, but the actual routes that are based on top of them are not. <clears throat> I think that was the clearest way I could explain it. If no one does that, please tell me in comments and I'll try again. It's a little weird when dealing with multiple routes and it actually took me a couple of weeks to kind of figure it out. And yeah, I'm not the best presenter. I'm trying my best. <laughs> I think I've said try my best now about 80 times. Shoot me. Um, so yes, this is the base intro. Um, I may actually add one more thing. Thing. Now that we've actually got this um, gateway um, up, even though it's not actually set up because we haven't told it to connect to you know anything by default, I'll show you how attaching a client should work as well. Do I actually didn't need to shut it down to do this, but anyhow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to we'll go onto our base image, and click clone again. And I am going to change this to uh, client one. Sure, why not? That's nice and boring. And stick it straight in there. And I'm going to generate new MAC addresses for all network adapters. And I'm going to go next, link to clone, clone. And there it is. And the same as last time, kind of. We're going to go into networks. We're going to enable a network adapter, but we're going to go to an internal network. And I'm going to click on the little drop down and I'm going to go youtube.net. OK. So, what this means is that the gateway is basically hosting internal nets and client one can only see internal nets. So, if I started both of these up, and I'm going to have to actually split screen these. Oh, that looks fantastic on a scaled screen. So we're going to boot both of these up in parallel. Why not? <laughs> oh my god, that font looks horrible. <laughs> uh, 
Ah, okay. I'm not actually sure which one of these I've got selected. Ah, there we go. Got this one. So we have the same username and password because we're using the same linked base image. And I'll log into these. And they're both called base still because I actually forgot to change the host name, which wasn't very clever. I can see that the left hand side one, I think my camera's inverted, um, is the gateway simply because of the uh, title at the top of the screen, which is there. So I am going to correct that right now simply by going in here. Host name is. gateway.ytlan and then I'll swap over to the other box and put this in as client1.ytlan cool and I'll re-log in to make sure that's applied it hasn't applied because I'll need to reboot them both <sighs> This is why most casters have scripts. <laughs> oh, is it going to keep the window, window orientation? I think it is. My poor CPU right now. By the way, I apologize for the odd squeaking in the background. This chair's a little bit squeaky. <laughs> okay, so there's client one. And here is the gateway. And if I did if config vtnet2 inet, um, let's pick a range, I don't know. Um, yeah, sure, why not? Let's, let's be a script kitty. And I did the same on the other side. Config vtnet0, this one. 10.13.31.8 slash 24. Excuse me. I am pretty sure I configured you an interface. Oh, God. I've configured it as EMO. Okay. Well, that gives me something to do. Um, so, basically, what's happened here is on the client, I have basically forgot to select the vert IO interface and it's um, bound it as an Intel E1000 card. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to send it the shutdown signal and it should exit nicely. There's been a lot of reboots in this video. I, I promise this isn't a Microsoft promo. promo. <sighs> right, okay. Go into Pliant, go into Settings, go into Network, and there we go. Click on Advanced and select Para Virtualized. There we go. And we'll kick that off. Ah, it's remembered where the window is. Lovely. Virtualization makes streaming so much easier. <laughs> and we're back in. Okay, so now if I type if config vtnet0 inet 10.13.31.8 slash 24, I should be able to ping the gateway machine on the left hand side. And there they are. And likewise, on the other machine, I should be able to ping 10.13.31.8. Now, also, I shouldn't be able to ping the internet. This is a completely private network set up virtually between these two machines. Um, VTNet0. So yeah, um, this is 
how I'm going to be basically conducting this series and how everything's going to be set up. Um, all of the clients will be basically captured behind the um, virtual gateway that I've created. And um, from there, I'm going to be doing the uh, multiple routing and bits and bobs like that. A few of you may have noticed that the client machines also have inherited the net.fibs 10 routing tables thing. Um, the thing with that is it doesn't actually matter. Um, by default, FreeBSD will always use routing table zero and it's only ever using one fib. It never will automatically assign something to a different routing table. So as long as we don't you know, use it, it's fine. Um, so it was just easier to do it that way around. Um, yes, so please, if you are interested in some various networking tips or tricks or routing tables or VPNs or any other bits and pieces, please write to me in the comments and tell me where to go with this because I am just going for it, <laughs> as you could probably tell. So, um, yes, um, Please tell me what you think and have a good one. Cheers.